It's Wednesday, October 30, 2019, and this is Globespan 24-7 News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. My name is Samuel Subnandan, coming to you live from Georgetown, Guyana. Here are the major headlines for today. Two charged with murder of Burby's fishermen, others being sought. Ghana is set to commence oil production in December instead. Opposition leader says GCOM's decision illegal, urges chair to speak now. 2020 verification and pension book distribution begins countrywide. And the nation's director is still searching for justice, recovering from surgery. Over to you, Whitney. Thank you, Samuel. Good evening and now for the headlines in the region and around the world. Millions are at risk from clo for coastal flooding owing to climate change. A woman has been jailed for the abuse of a child in Trinidad and Tobago. Indigenous leader, four others killed in Colombia. Democrats lay out next steps for Trump's possible impeachment and 12 men found hiding out in a refrigerated lorry in Belgium. Let's join the sports desk with Kingsley Bryan for today's headlines. Thanks, Whitney. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be covering in tonight's sportscast. The third annual Turbo Knockout Football Tournament is officially launched. And North Georgetown Primary disqualified from play in the ongoing courts Peary tournament. Also internationally, Lionel Messi eclipses Cristiano Ronaldo in total club goals scored. Over back to you, Samuel. Thanks, Kingsley. And now for a look at the news. The Ghana police force has issued wanted bulletins for two more men who are wanted for questioning in relation to the piracy murder attack in Burbese. The men have been identified as O'Brien Fraser and Anot Budraj, and they are wanted by the police for questioning in relation to the piracy murder committed on Lamar Pitri, Vishnu Siram, Kewal Kasun, and Marvin Tamishwar at Quarantine River. Anyone with information that may lead to the arrest of O'Brien Fraser and Anot Budraj is asked to contact the police on telephone numbers 333-3876, 911 or the nearest police station. Meanwhile, two men who reside at Belvedere, Quarantine Burbies, were today charged with the murder of K. Walkasun Lamar Pitri, Marvin Tamishwar and Vishnu Siram killed in a piracy attack. The four fishermen who departed on a fateful trip to sea earlier in October. The bodies of the other two fishermen, Marvin Tamasar, also called Buddy and Bin Laden, 20, of Miss Phoebe Village and Vishnu Siram called Kevin, 20, of the same village are still to be recovered. The two accused have been identified as 30-year-old Narain Danraj and 22-year-old Suresh Sundat, both of Belvedere squatting area and they made their appearances in the number 51 village magistrates court before magistrate Peter Yu where the indictable charge was read to them. It is alleged that the incident occurred between October 5 and 13 within the vicinity of the number 53 and 58 for sure. The two men were charged on the section 7 of the hijacking and piracy act of Guyana chapter 1008 and were remanded to prison until November 7 when the matter will be called again at the Wim Magistrates Court. Family members of the late fishermen have since expressed their gratitude to the ranks of the Ghana Police Force, whose actions have paved the way for them to receive justice for their loved ones. Police Commander Calvin Brutus has since relayed that three other suspects are being sought by lawmen and the police will soon issue wanted bulletins for them. Sundat called Bokban or Ajay and Danraj called Chuchubai, reportedly confessed to killing the four fishermen, but stressed that it was never their intention to kill the men, but merely rob them of their bounty. On October 5, the fishermen left a wharf at number 65 village for sea aboard. Sarah One, a fishing vessel owned by Sharanand Rabindranath of number 68 village quarantine. The bodies of Kisun and Petri were subsequently found. Days after the fishing boat was found abandoned at the foreshore with the men belongings and bloodstains. Now that the Ghana Elections Commission, GCOM, has moved to publish the list for the recent house-to-house -house registration, Opposition People's Progressive Party, PPP, is now claiming that the list contains several mistakes and as such, the party is calling for it to be corrected. More in this report. 
In a strongly worded statement on Tuesday, the PPP said what is more upsetting is the fact that GCOM has now called Guyanese to check their names on that list. More than 300,000 Guyanese were registered during the exercise and would therefore have to visit various GCOM offices to do so. The party noted that it made checks and did its own investigations and made some astonishing discoveries. According to the PPP, there are thousands of names duplicated on the preliminary list of electors and thousands of persons who are under the voting age of 18. Open quote, our investigations would have found too that dozens of persons listed as new registrants cannot be found at the addresses listed and this is a serious cause for concern, fueling the worry that there are many non-existent persons on the list published by GCOM. End of quote according to the statement. The PPP also maintained that House to House Registrants list is not a supplementary list to the PLE and cannot be used during a claims and objections exercise. There is no provisions in the laws of Ghana to authorize the publication of a duplicate list that does not originate from the National Register of Registrants database, the party noted. According to the PPP, the house to house registration process was flawed from the beginning and any attempt to merge the data from that process with the National Register of Registrants can compromise the entire database. The PPP called on GCOM to immediately withdraw the house to house registrants list and continue with the ongoing claims and objections exercise. The Ghana Elections Commission has revealed that the ongoing claims and objection exercise has seen a total of 3,924 new persons already since the exercise began at the beginning of this month. GCOM's Public Relations Officer Yolanda Ward informed media operatives that the Commission has completed 17,243 transactions so far, of which 9,516 9, are transfers. The Commission also informed that there were 1,672 corrections, 1,627 replacements, 472 photo retakes, and 32 objections recorded during the exercise as well. The ongoing claims and objection period comes to an end on November 11, 2019. For Glowspan 24-7 News, this is Kingsley Bryan. Thanks, Kingsley. Following its weekly statutory meeting on Tuesday, commissioners of the Ghana Elections Commission informed media operatives that it was decided that those persons who have failed to uplift their ID card since 2008 will be removed from the list. It was earlier reported that the issue gave rise to much contention at the commission, with commissioners from both sides of the aisle venting either their support or disapproval of the proposal. At that instance, Government-aligned Commissioner Vincent Alexander, in his arguments, rejected the suggestions that the removal of the names of persons from the NRR merely because they have not collected their national ID cards will potentially disenfranchise persons. Rather, Alexander said the use of uncollected ID cards would be as a method for objection. Using the ID card issue to determine the presence of our voters, their existence. It's like an objection, huh? So the issue is not the ID card. The issue is that these persons, since 2008 and beyond 2008, have not in any way presented themselves to be present, to be known, to be alive, to be existing, to be resident. And the calling them Writing to them gives us an opportunity to make a determination in the context of like an objection as to where are they, are they here, are they real people at this time. On the flip side of the coin, the opposition nominated commissioner Bibi Shadik is insistent that failure to uplift an ID card is not reason enough to be removed from the list of electors. There's a law that says you can deregister people, but then you got they got a they got rules that say how, what we're deregistering. The person dies or the person goes mad. Right? Not because they income for collect the ID card. But during Tuesday's meeting, Chairman 
uh, chairwoman rather of the Ghana Elections Commission, retired Justice Claudette Singh, used her deciding vote in the matter, hence allowing for those persons to be omitted from the official list of electors. Government nominated Commissioner Charles Corbyn, following the meeting, relayed that the proposal to highlight these names was discarded, but this new addition functions within the ambit of an objection. Those persons for whom we had made efforts to locate previously, that we will follow the procedures um, in the NRA, which will include publication of those names in the possibly the newspapers and so on, in addition to sending notices directly to the, the addresses which GCOM has on record. And should they fail to respond within 21 days, then their names will not be extracted to be included in the RLE and the official list of electors. However, those board, their names will not be cancelled from the NRR. So it would only mean that if these persons exist, they may miss this round of elections because their names will not be extracted to be included in the NRR as long as those procedures that she has outlined has been followed. It was previously indicated that over 20,000 persons are presently on that list of persons who have failed to uplift their ID cards. But opposition nominated commissioners are maintaining that the process will disenfranchise those persons and as such are of the opinion that Jikam Chair erred in her determination. I want to start with the most egregious of decisions. The chair has ruled that persons who have not uplifted their identification cards uh, that their names will be published in the newspapers and they will be given 21 days within which to collect it. And if they, uh, if they fail to respond to that, then they, will, um, then they will be prevented from voting. 21 days? Yes. I am of the considered view that this is an unlawful decision because it imposes an additional requirement on persons to be allowed to vote. And for that reason and that reason alone, uh, it can be considered unlawful. There are many other reasons why that is considered unlawful, and um, I will leave that at that. After their names are published at a time yet to be decided upon, those persons will have 21 days to verify their existence on the commission's list. The decision taken by the chair of the Ghana Elections Commission retired Justice Claudette Singh to remove the names of those persons who have not yet uplifted their identification cards is not sitting well with the opposition People's Progressive Party. In fact, General Secretary of the party Barry Jatio went on for quite some time during his weekly press conference to argue that the decision is illegal. This is the latest manifestation of these acts of desperation. The proposal by the APNU commissioners to strike off the name of the voters from the national, uh, from the OLE, the official list of electors, if they do not pick up their ID cards. Now, this is patently illegal. Your collection of an ID card to losing your right to vote is an affront to Guyana, to Guyanese. It's illegal and we will never allow it to stand. And all of those people who say that they believe that, you know, they, they hold the right to vote sacred, all of these parties, the small parties and civil society, I hope they stand up on this one. Jagbio said now that such a major decision has been made, it is time for the GCOM chairwoman to speak. The retired judge had told sections of the media that she will speak to the press when major decisions are made. Her comments come after the opposition leader had urged her to speak to issues and decisions taken by GCOM so as to provide some level of clarity 
to the general public. Our decision to support the APNU proposal to remove people's names from the voters list because they did not pick up their ID card cannot be explained. And I hope that whenever, because she said when decisions are made, I saw her interview with Kite Show News, she said when decisions are made, she will speak with the press. Well, a decision has been made here and we we would like her to explain this decision. Now that a decision has been made by the commission, well, at least from what I'm not even sure that that decision is made because that's what we heard from the commissioners. But when she confirms this, she needs to answer why in this case she wants to, or she's sided with the three commissioners to, to, in a process that will disenfranchise thousands of Ghanaians and would be illegal if they don't pick up their ID cards which is not a requirement to vote. It's so simple, I don't understand how this decision will ever stand. The opposition leader also referred to a previous matter of a similar nature, which brought up for discussion during the time of former GCM chair, Dr. Steve Surge Bali, sometime in 2011. 43,187 cards were still not correct, collected. Um, he stressed that these are not voting cards and pointed out that a constitutional requirement to vote is to be registered, not necessarily to be in possession of an identification card. This matter was dealt with in the past by GCOM. It's in the newspapers here. And at that time, 43,000 people did not pick up their ID cards. Now it's 28,000. But they didn't lose the right to vote, which is a sacred, sacred right. And the Chief Justice herself, in her ruling, recent ruling, pointed out um, in 121 of the ruling and section, the right to be registered to vote and the right to vote are sacrosanct and fundamental. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to which Guyana has acceded and which is incorporated into our constitution establishes the right to vote as a matter of international human rights law and provides that every citizen has a right to vote. That is the ruling of the Chief Justice recently. But Jagdeo did not stop there. He went on to make further reference to the Chief Justice's ruling, which highlighted the case that was handled by the very GCOM chair when she sat on the bench. As you know, this the Pereira matter was the two political parties before the 1997 elections agreed that we will use the national identification form at the polling places as the only means to identify voters. After they lost the elections, they went and challenged that agreement that they had with the two, the two, between the two parties. And, and Justice Claudette Singh said, basically, she shortened the term, the PPP's term in office, and, our, and, and ruled that the ID card was not a requirement to vote. That was Claudette Singh's ruling. But she said in that was opposition leader Barrett Jagdu at his weekly press conference today. Meanwhile, President David Granger Wednesday morning sworn, swore in a Minister of Public Security, Kemraj Ramjatan, to perform the duties of Prime Minister at the Ministry of the Presidency. The Ministry of the Presidency in a statement noted that Prime Minister Moses Nagamudu is currently overseas. As the preparations for the March 2020 general and regional elections intensifies, yet another political movement has thrown their hat in the ring to take the seat of government next year. Change Ghana is the brainchild of businessman Robert Badal, owner of the Pegasus Hotel and chartered accountant Nigel Hines. Badal is touted as the presidential candidate while Hines was promoted uh, as the running mate. 
This is now the fifth political party to be launched to be launched in an election where the smaller parties are insistent on striking a much needed balance in the country's political future. The launch was held at the Pegasus Hotel and saw in attendance just over 100 persons who all wanted to hear what this new party would be offering the Guyanese populace if given the chance to rule. At the launch, the two candidate deliver, ca candidates rather, delivered their promises to the audience and chief among its promises is the party's intention to exempt nurses and teachers from paying taxes. Also, the party expressed their intention to improve local content in the petroleum and other industries and ensure there's long-term economic development. Change Ghana, like other movements, has included in its plan of development free education, local content in the petroleum industry, and reliable electricity, with Badal, who recently served as chairman of GPL's board, promising to fix the power company. The party was launched onto the team. Let's ignite our economy. Right choice right now. Remember to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest news in Ghana and the Caribbean and around the world. Coming up on the other side of the break, Ghana is set to commence oil production in December and nation's direct is still searching for justice, recovering from surgery. Travelspan GT is a proud sponsor of Globespan 24-7 News. Here are some exciting news from Travelspan GT. Fares have dropped for next year, starting January 20 to August. American Airlines has cheap fares on non-stop flights to New York. Flights are as low as $306 US dollars one way and $540 round trip, all tax included. Take advantage of these cheap fares on American Airlines non-stop flights to New York. Travelspan has also cheap fares to Miami, Toronto, Canada and the Caribbean. Call Travelspan GT in Georgetown at 227-1701, that's 227-1701 or in Rose Hall call 337-4298 and New Amsterdam at 333-6230. That, that call Travel Span GT in Georgetown at 227-1701. That's 227-1701. Or in Rose Hall, call 337-4287. And in New Amsterdam at 333-6230. Thanks for staying with us. You're watching Globespan 24-7 News. Following his confession, rice farmer Jairam Seeprasad of Parfait Harmony on the West Bank of Demrar made an appearance at the Wales Magistrates Court where he was charged with the murder of 14-year-old Christopher Bastio. The accused made his appearance before Magistrate Zamila Ali Seepal and was not required to plead to the indictable charge which read, that between October 16 and 25, he murdered Basi of Parfait Harmony. He was remanded to prison until December 12, when he will make his next court appearance. The 42-year-old confessed to murdering Basi and burying his body in a shallow grave. The teen was reported missing since October 17, after he left home to visit a friend. His partially decomposed body was found on October 25. The rice farm later admitted that he and Bastio were in Baimin in their village when an argument over money ensued. He added that he picked up a piece of wood and dealt the teenager a blow to his head and left him lying unconscious. However, the man relayed that later that very night, he returned to the location, picked up Bastio's body and dug a seven feet two inches shallow grave where he buried the teenager. The Ministry of Social Protection has announced that the 2020 Verification and Senior Citizen Pension Book distribution will commence soon. It was noted that the Ministry has made every effort to place distribution centers closest to pensioners. Seniors are asked to check the schedules listed below for locations, uh, dates and times. They are reminded to walk with their 2019 Senior Citizen pension booklet and the corresponding national identification card. The ministry is also reminded pensioners that they cannot authorize anyone to uplift their pension booklets. Officers will deliver booklets to shut-ins. Meanwhile, oil production in Ghana is targeted for a possible December startup at the LISA phase one development months ahead of the originally planned timeline of 2020. The LISA field 
sits in the giant 6.6 .6 million acres of the Stavro block in Guyana. U.S. major oil, oil major ExxonMobil made a record 14 discoveries on the block since 2015 and continues to search for more petroleum resources. Hess Chief Executive Officer John Hess said in a report on Wednesday, my quote, in September, we announced our 14th discovery in the Stavro block at Triple Tail, offshore Guyana, and we are now targeting December for first oil from the Lisa 1 development, end quote. The Lisa Phase 1 development is now targeted to start production in December of this year and will produce up to 120,000 gross barrels per day, utilizing the Lisa Destiny FPSO, which arrived in Guyana on August 29, 2019. The FPSO was converted from the VLCC by Capel. It will be available to store 1.6 million barrels of crude oil. The LISA Phase 2 development was sanctioned in May 2019 and will use the LISA Unite Unity FPSO to produce up to 220,000 gross barrels per oil per day, with first oil expected by mid-2022. Pending government approval, a third development, Payara, is expected to produce up to 220,000 barrels per day with startup in 2023. The Stavro block is operated by ExxonMobil with a 45% interest, with Hess and Sinoc Petroleum having 30% and 25% interest, respectively. Members of the SEMGAN robotics team that recently participated in the first ever First Global sponsored. World Robotics Championship in Dubai were on Wednesday honored with a small ceremony hosted by First Lady Sandra Granger at the Buridi Banab in State House. More in this report. Team Guyana overcame tremendous challenges to end the three-day global tournament with six victories and three losses, which earned them an overall ranking of 39th place out of the 190 countries which took part in the global competition. The ranking means that Ghana finds itself among the elite top 25% teams in world rankings. Given this recent success, the team was treated to an official welcome home ceremony by the First Lady, Sandra Granger, who said she's extremely pleased with the team's performance, as it sends home the fact that the investment in STEM project was worth it. The First Lady also thanked those who sponsored and supported the team in whatever way. She also praised the team being awarded the Albert Einstein Gold Medal for Excellence. Team Ghana 2019 won the Albert Einstein Gold Medal for Excellence at the first global robotics competition in Dubai. The medal is awarded in gold, silver and bronze to the teams whose robot performed the best during the first global challenge. It is essentially the top individual team award given by competition judges. Meanwhile, in her remarks, co-founder of STEM Ghana, Ms. Karen Abrams, said she was more so pleased with the positive representation that the team provided to Guyana. Not, not only building a remarkable robot and having to wear with all the device a great strategy, but displaying professionalism, representing the country well, being a role model for the game, 190 countries. I mean, we all did that. Can you dig it? <laughs> also present at this morning's ceremony were Ministers of Public Communication, Kathy Hughes, and Education, Dr. Henry, who also commended the team on a job well done. Director of Sports, Christopher June, was also present at the ceremony. A report from the competition's website stated that, open quote, this year the first global organization hosted 190 national teams out of the 195 countries in the world. It was the largest and most competitive global competition to date, and teams which are mentored by large, well-known engineering firms in their home countries often do very well. For Glowspan 24-7 News, this is Kingsley Bryan. 
Thanks, Kingsley. The Ghana Sugar Cooperation Bicycle conducted temporary repairs to the damaged parts of the Stortville Corker door today. The Civil Defense Commission CDC visited the community of Stortville Region 3, where a massive overtopping of water was seen poured in onto residents' land yesterday. The Department of Public Information reported that a section of the Corker door was damaged. Approximately four to five boards are broken. Control structures have been opened to minimize the effects of the current spring tide. Relative to the spring tides, the Civil Defense Commission, among other government agencies and ministries, are working assiduously to mitigate the situation. The CDC has also announced on Tuesday that it is actively engaging national agencies to alleviate and address the concerns of residents in flood affected communities. Nine months after he was shot in the arm, Dr. Brian O'Toole, the director of Nations, is recovering from another surgery he just completed. But not yet, no one has been arrested for the crime. Here is that story. Back in January 2019, School of the Nations director, Dr. Brian O'Toole, was shot in the arm as he was about to enter his home one Sunday night after dinner with a scholar from the University of Bedfordshire in the UK. Nations Chief Executive Officer Dr. Dexter Phillips relayed that the shooting occurred around 22 hours, just as Dr. O'Toole closed his gate and was about to enter his home. Dr. Phillips continued that he was on his doorstep when the shooter, who was already in Dr. O'Toole's yard, came out from his hiding place and shot him in the arm before fleeing the scene. Dr. O'Toole was admitted a patient at a city hospital, where his condition was initially listed as stable. It was a public opinion that the shooting appeared to be linked to an attempted robbery. However, in a speculative twist, it was reported that earlier in the day, Dr. O'Toole met with parents of nations after a Facebook post surfaced the very Sunday morning, which has been shared in its entirety on social media platforms, of a person threatening to open fire on students of the school. Subsequently, a student was expelled after posting a WhatsApp message threatening to shoot up the school. The student later said he was just joking in the post. Now, some nine months following the shooting, Dr. Toole in a missive relayed that he was once again resigned to a hospital bed in New York, recovering from another operation to try to restore the paralyzed hand, which had been shot during the incident. Dr. O'Toole further noted that the surgeon is, however, pessimistic about whether the function can indeed be restored to the hand. In a strongly worded statement, Dr. O'Toole is calling for a proper investigation as he believes it will be another case of justice being denied. He said, open quotes, nine months later and the boy in Florida that started all the mayhem with his vivid and horrific threats to violent action given free play on social media known to hundreds if not thousands in Guyana remains unpunished because he apparently told his FBI investigators that it was all just a joke. Is the FBI so easily satisfied? End of quote. Dr. Tool questioned, open quote, would the response have been the same if such threats were made at JFK airport or aimed at purely American interests or institutions in Guyana? End of quote. The School of the Nations director stated that after contact was made with the Guyana Police Force again a few weeks ago with further information regarding the potential shooter, a one-line response was received thanking him for the information. But, as before, throughout the nine months, no report of any follow-up. He further added that, open quote, the relevant authorities in Guyana have been provided with reports and allegations of drug dealing in a number of schools. But once again, we are given no information on any follow-up. Can the police be surprised by the widespread reluctance on the part of thousands in society to share information with them? End of quote. Dr. Atul made a passionate cry for more to be done to curb the use of chemicals or drugs among our young people as the dangerous trends and effects have been beginning to manifest themselves in several sections of society. He concluded, open quote, will this be a topic of debate as we enter the election season? Which, if any, party will tackle this most urgent cause facing the youth of this country? 
Or will their continued inaction simply convince those who profit hugely from this misery that the field is theirs to profit with as they will? Will they win any votes as the range of the party hopefuls try to cross the finish line? End of quote. For Glowspan 24-7 News, this is Kingsley Bryan. Thanks, Kingsley. After weeks of acquiring funds through SMS and mobile money Guyana MMG to assist those affected by Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, a GDT has accumulated close to $130,000 through the two platforms. The company's public relations and corporate communication manager, Jasmine Harris, handed over the check to Anita Lane, project manager acting of the Civil Defense Commission. The company is happy to contribute through the kind donations of the public to the relief efforts being championed by the CDC. We are pleased that our products assisted in fundraising for a worthy, worthy cause, and quote, Harris remarked. Lane expressed gratitude to GDT for its effort to amass the monies. I, th I am thankful to GDT and all of the private, public, and non-governmental organizations which have partnered with us in supporting the Bahamas after being impacted by Hurricane Dorian. On September 1, Dorian, a Category 5 hurricane ripped through the small Caribbean archipelago with, near, with winds near 240 kilo, kilometers per hour. Hurricane Dorian claimed the lives of 65 persons on the island and was deemed the strongest hurricane on record to affect the Bahamas. We are now on Twitter and Instagram, hashtag Globespan247. Do follow us and spread the word. Coming up on the other side of the break with Whitney Prasad at our New York studio, millions at risk from coastal flooding owing to climate change and indigenous leader for others killed in Colombia. Please stay tuned. To keep up with breaking news in Guyana, the rest of the Caribbean and on the international scene, like, follow and subscribe to Globespan 24-7's Facebook and YouTube news page. Join the conversation, get live news on the go and news and details right here on Globespan 24-7 News. Travelspan is a proud sponsor of Globespan 24-7 News. Travelspan has some cheap fares to Guyana on American Airlines flights. Fly from January for 234 one-way and 512 round trip. Take advantage of these cheap fares on American non-stop flights from JFK to Guyana. That's non-stop flights from JFK to Guyana, starting as low as 234 one-way and 512 round trip. And also has the cheapest fares for Christmas that starts as low as 799 round trip. Travel span celebrating 25 years in business with over 10 offices to serve you. Call 718-845-0437. That's 718-845-0437. Or book online at Travelspan.com. Book early and save. Thank you, Samuel. Thanks for staying with us. And now for a look at news in the diaspora. Millions million more people will be at risk of close to coastal flooding from climate change. Climate-driven sea level rise later this century. This is according to a new research conducted by Climate Central, a U.S.-based nonprofit news organization. The report comes at a time when many countries across the globe, including Guyana, have been affected by alarmingly higher than usual tides, which has been causing severe flooding in areas that are below sea level. The report said that 190 million people will be living in areas that are projected to be below high tide lines come 2100. Today, the group calculates roughly 110 million are presently occupying these lands protected by walls, embankments and other coastal defenses, which are currently deteriorating due to massive water pressure like the case of the Georgetown Sea Wall. Over the past few months, citizens of Guyana have been greatly affected by the abnormal high tides, which caused unexpected flooding, damage to homes and farmlands and even killed animals and livestock that were in the affected areas. To date, officials in the country are working assiduously to find solutions that could help those areas that are currently affected by the high tides. And a 49-year-old woman yesterday faced a court and is expected to be sentenced for allegedly abusing her then two-year-old son in 2008 in Trinidad and Tobago. The court was told that the child, who is now 13 years old, does not live with her. With her. The woman pleaded guilty before Waterman Lachu in San Fernando 
In San Fernando First Criminal Court, presenting the facts to the court, State Attorney Katricia Ambrose said in February of 2008, a volunteer from the children's home where the child was after he was born visited the child at the home and noticed that he had a cut under his foot. Then in May of 2008, she observed that he was dragging, had a burn on his index finger, his leg was black and blue, and he had a fever. The accused told the volunteer that the child had broken his leg. In July of 2008, a secretary at the children's home picked up the child at his home to take him to a fun day at a primary school. She noticed he had scars and bruises about his body. The woman was charged in 2008 after injuries were discovered on the child's body. A medical report stated that the injuries were likely inflicted by cigarette burns, fingernail scratches, and blunt objects using mild to moderate blunt force. Christina Butista, an indigenous leader and four volunteer community guards, have been killed in southwest Colombia by rebels. Police are aware and confirmed that members of a dissident rebel group are behind the attack. A report said the number of indigenous Colombians killed has risen suddenly amid a resurgence of violence by non-confirming rebel groups and soldiers. According to the local indigenous council, the incident occurred during a routine vehicular check when the leader of a rebel group along with two of his men demanded they be let through without following procedures. A standoff ensued with the indigenous guard raising the alarm, prompting more locals to gather. And the rebels opened fire, killing the four members of the guard and Bautista, the indigenous governor of the area. Six others were reportedly injured. The president has said the interior minister to the area to address the ongoing crisis in the country. He also said that he had ordered the military to find a criminal group responsible for the attack, as the necessary punishment by law will be served. With U.S. President Donald Trump facing impeachment, the Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives have published a resolution setting out the next steps in their impeachment efforts against the president, according to which the motion sets out a more public phase of the inquiry and hands the lead role in hearings to the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff. Reports confirm that the House controlled by the Democrats will vote on the measure on Thursday. Meanwhile, a White House spokeswoman said that the resolution was an illegitimate to make sham saying all hearings have been held behind closed doors and the vote to make the impeachment process public is about the procedure and not a ballot on whether or not to impeach the president republicans have criticized democrats for the closed door hearings up to this point in which republican lawmakers have also taken part canadian prime minister justin trudeau recently met with governor general julie payette to discuss what he intends to form into government. The party entered the campaign with 177 seats and will now need opposition support to pass legislation in Parliament. Trudeau's Liberals won 157 seats in last week's federal election, 13 short of a majority. With a minority government, Trudeau's government will first have to survive a confidence vote on a speech laying out his plans for, the go for governing. Trudeau and Payette were expected to talk at the meetings about a time for Parliament to reconvene, among other issues involved in the process of forming government. Since the meeting, the Prime Minister's office has not released any details about what transpired during the meeting. And Prime Minister Boris Johnson and opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn have clashed over National Health Service, Brexit and leadership at the, late prime, the last Prime Minister's question before the general election. Corbyn said voters had a once-in-a-generation chance to save the NHS, which was in great danger that at any time in its history. He stressed that voters had the chance to back real change. Meanwhile, the PM warned of economic catastrophe and political disaster if Labour got into power. Political parties are readying themselves for a general election campaign after MPs vote for a 12 December poll. The legislation approved by MPs on Tuesday has begun its passage through the House of Lords, where it is not expected to be opposed. Globespan 24-7 will be following this story closely and updating you as time goes by. And a recent visit by a group of European parliamentarians to the Indian, Indian administered Kashmir prompted outrage from local politicians who have not been allowed to go. 
Politicians criticized the visit as nothing more than a PR stunt, as this is the first international delegation to visit the region since August, when India's ruling Hindu party stripped the state of its independence, splitting it into two federally run territories and locking it down for weeks. On Tuesday, the day of their arrival, European government officials were given a tightly controlled tour of the main city of the region. On the same day, five civilians were killed by suspected militants, while clashes with security forces were reported from about 40 locations around the city. A Tanzanian billionaire has said that he has asked his kidnapper to shoot him six days after being held captive due to overwhelming torture. The, this abduction 12 months ago outside a hotel gym in the country's main city sparked a major manhunt. Speaking to the media for the first time about his ordeal, the now free businessman told the BBC that he was blindfolded and disoriented when he made his plea. He was released after 10 days and say, says no ransom was paid. He told reporters that his kidnappers left him in a field 15 minutes drive away from where he had been abducted. The authorities have not established a clear motive for the abduction and investigations are continuing. He believes that the kidnappers gave up due to pressure built up from the media and political attention. And police have said that 12 men have been discovered hiding inside a refrigerator lorry in a car park near a motorway in Belgium's province. Reports stated that the police were called to the scene on Tuesday night by the driver who suspected that people had climbed inside his fruit and vegetable lorry. Eleven Syrians and one Sudanese man were found safe and well and were handed over to immigration officials. Last week, 39 people were found dead in a refrigerator lorry in England. The driver of the vehicle, which arrived in England via the Belgian ferry port, has been charged with their manslaughter. And that has ended news in the region and around the world. Let's now head over to our studio in India for Tech News with Kumar Doshi, Whitney Prasad saying good evening. Do stay tuned for more news. Thank you, Whitney. Namaste, salam and good day to everyone. This is TechBeat on Globespan 24-7. Today, let's look at IP codes in smartphones. IP code or International Protection Marking, also called Ingress Protection Marking, classifies and rates the degree of protection provided by the mechanical casings and electrical enclosures against intrusion, dust, accidental contact and water. It is published by the International Electrotechnical Commission or IEC. When a phone manufacturer tells you that your phone is waterproof, it means that it will repel water most of the time. So how do phone manufacturers achieve waterproofing? They usually apply a lot of adhesive and seals to close off every possible entry point. The area where the screen fits in is sealed off with a lot of glue. The SIM card opening is usually sealed off with a rubber ring that goes around the inside of the SIM tray. The opening that needs to stay open like speaker, microphone hole, headphone jack, etc. is closed from the inside of the component or a water resistant mesh between the outside of the phone and the microphone. The next step in improving waterproofing is adding hydrophobic coating onto the circuit boards itself so that if water gets inside your phone, it will still prevent the circuit boards from corrosion. How will you know how much water and dust resistant is your phone? It is denoted by the IP code. The IP code has two numbers. The first digit tells us about protection against solid objects like dust and the second digit deals with liquid. If there is an X instead of a number, it means that the part of the test wasn't performed or it isn't relevant to the device. Let's talk about dust. The typical one for phone is IP6X. Dust is sprinkled on the phone to see whether the dust enters the phone or not. If the dust doesn't enter, it's given IP6X rating. The water test gives the phone IPX7 or IPX8 ratings. In this test, the phone has to withstand jets of water spray and also submergence under water, usually more than 1 meter, for about 30 to 40 minutes under high pressure. If the phone passes both the tests, it is given IPX7 or IPX8 ratings depending on the test results. 
IPX7 means your phone can stay under water up to 1 meter for 30 minutes and IPX8 means 1 meter up to 35 minutes. One drawback of making these devices water resistant is that it's much harder for you to get inside your phones which means it's much harder to repair them. Once you open your phone to get your repairs done, your phone will lose the dust and waterproofing. Over time, the adhesive and rubber is going to degrade. Also, water damage is not included in your phone insurance. This wraps up the tech beat for today. I'm Kumar Doshi bringing tech news from India. Back to our studio in Guyana for more news to come. Thank you. Thanks, Kumar. We'll now take a look at our bridge reports. Now for a look at what's happening in the world of sport with Kingsley Bryan. Thanks, Samuel. Now for the details in our sports news. The third edition of the annual Turbo Knockout Football Tournament was launched on Tuesday with 20 teams set to participate in what is now seen as an annual event. The teams are Georgetown Football Club, Campton Football Club, Defending Champions Northern Rangers, Rhythm Squad, GT Panthers, Peely, Eastvelt, Beacons FC, Police, Buxton Stars, Mahika Determinators, Dynamic, Tamiri Panthers, The Eiffelot Warriors, Pro Drawing, Eagles United, Black Pearl FC, Santas on the 20, Futa Conquerors on the 20, and Buxton United on the 20. The tournament will feature 10 playing days and will kick off on November 9 and culminate on December 6. The first prize for the tournament will be $400,000, with second place taking home $200,000, third place $100,000, and fourth $50,000. The tournament will be played exclusively at the Ministry of Education ground on Carifesta Avenue. Also, we'll tell you that finalists North Georgetown Primary have been found guilty of fielding two ineligible players in the ongoing courts Peary football tournament, and as a result, they have been disqualified. This means Genesis Harmony School, which lost to them 2-0 in last Saturday's semi-final, will now play St. Agnes this Saturday in the finals. In a statement to the media, Petro organization relayed that after a successful protest, which was lodged by Genesis Harmony School, the decision was made following investigations. The protest was against Akeem Joyce and Christina Rodius, who both participated in last Saturday's semi-final round for North Georgetown. They are both above the eligible age. The statement further noted that Petro organization thereafter perused the 2017 and 2018 registration records and confirmed the Genesis protest as being true and accurate. According to the statement, it is, open quote, regrettable this has resulted in the elimination of the North Georgetown Primary from the tournament, as they are guilty of using ineligible players in the competition under different aliases. Separately, coach Aubrey McKenzie has been suspended for two years from engaging and or coaching any team or school that is participating in any tournament coordinated by the Petro organization. And internationally, in their ongoing battle to break records and outdo each other, Lionel Messi went one up on Cristiano Ronaldo, or made that two up actually, when Messi scored twice in Barcelona's 5-1 to one thrashing of mid-table Valladolid in La Liga Tuesday, the Argentine moved past his longtime Portuguese rival on club goals with 608 in 695 games. All have come with Barcelona. Ronaldo has scored 606 goals for sport in Lisbon, Manchester United, Real Madrid and Juventus in 813 matches. After the game at the Camp Nou, 
the softly spoken Messi didn't discuss his goal scoring record. But Barcelona manager Ernesto Valverde was happy to gush about a 32 year old. Open quote He got this talent nobody else has, Valverde told reporters. Open quote He can get past anybody. End of quote. And that has brought us to the end of our news for sports for today. Back to you, Samuel. Thanks, Kingsley. And that has brought us to the end of today's news. Before you go, here's a recap of our major headlines. Two charged with murder of Burmese fishermen, others being sought. Guyana is set to commence oil production in December instead. Opposition leader says a GCOM's decision illegal, urges chair to speak now. Government announced 2000, 2020 verification and pension book distribution. And the nation's director still searching for justice, recovering from surgery. Thanks for watching Globespan 24 7 News. On behalf of myself, Samuel Sidnanen, the news and technical team, until next time, do have a pleasant rest of the evening. Goodbye for now.